Hi Graham, could Hello. you please tell me a bit about yourself and why you're here in Glasgow today? Uh, well, my name is Graham Linehan. I'm a comedy writer. I was a comedy writer until about three or four years ago when I started started talking about this stuff. Uh, I thought I could talk about it um, without any kind of uh, uh, without the problems that a lot of people have when they talk about this stuff because I knew that um, most people who disagree with gender ideology they come off the uh, trans rights activists come after their jobs or their livelihoods or their, or their or their employers or whatever it happens to be and I thought I didn't have a, jo a real job I didn't have real employers. Um, so I thought I was more protected than most. Um, I also had the TED musical, Father Ted musical, to fall back on, which I was, uh, which I, which I thought, well, they can't cancel that <laughs> because it's too big. But then COVID happened, and um, and as a result, the TED musical kind of fell off the radar for a while. Hopefully, it'll be back. And I was kind of left exposed, and and uh, uh, you know, I was lo I lost work. Um, they came after my family and you know it, it's become my life in a way because I think that this uh, ideology is so corrupt and evil that I had to say something I had to fight against it so that's why I'm here really I come to anything like where I think my presence my help matters you know so that's uh, I wanted to support Marion and, and show that um, the, the intimidation that's being used against her, intimidation tactics that have been used against her won't work, you know, that we'll keep speaking up whatever they do. So you've previously talked about these themes of transgenderism in your comedy. <laughs> like you had a, a, a particular episode that was well known that had a trans woman character. Yeah, I had an IT crowd episode. This was before I knew how insane uh, the activists were. And, and to be honest with you, when it came out, it didn't really cause that much of a problem. But um, I did notice that the pushback against the episode where we featured a trans character uh, in the IT crowd, it got more, the, the, the pushback was more uh, vicious and uh, weird than I'd ever experienced before. These were people who couldn't, literally couldn't take a joke, uh, who were kind of, um, uh, exploding with rage all the time about any mention of them whatsoever. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of, that was the thing that woke me up to how strange trans ideology was and how, and how vicious trans activism was. So it was people, uh, the response to your work in particular, that was what people would call peak to you? Or had no. you been aware of the conversation on Twitter in a wider sense? No, it, 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 what, what, what happened was once I realised, I, 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 I responded to a few people who were talking to me about the episode and I was saying, well, you know, it's a joke and, it, you know, the character, in the end, the character uh, of Douglas falls and, you know, realises that he loved the trans woman who he, who he dumped. So I didn't really see what the problem was, but I, I guess, I guess it was just one of these things that I wasn't aware that there are all these taboos that you're not supposed to mention. You know, you're not supposed to mention, you know, the very real discomfort someone might have if they found out that their girlfriend used to be a man. There's nothing weird about that. That's a completely natural response for someone to have. But of course, in, in their world, it's outrageous that anyone would have a problem with it and stuff, you know, but, you know, it, I, I, I began to, it was around then that I started paying attention more to the arguments and realising these don't stand up, these are silly. And, and, someone, and, and then I realised, and this was probably one of the moments, one of the early moments where I did peak, was um, when I realised that trans women are women was meant literally. That blew me away, especially when you consider that 80% of, of trans-identified males don't have any surgery. I was like, what do you mean they're women? If you have a penis, you're a man, it's full, full stop. You know, that's, them's the rules. I don't make the rules, they're the rules. So uh, I, it was kind of a slow dawning of realization that these people were insane. These, this activism was insane. And, uh, and then I found out, you know, about people like Julie Bindle, who'd been canceled years before, who was, you know, Julie would be attacked outside venues and prevented from speaking. And I realized that there was a similar kind of um, course of action against anyone who's considered to be an enemy. 
and it was uh, very close to how Scientologists deal with enemies. You know, there's a there's a there's a principle in Scientology called fair game. It basically means that anyone who is an effective enemy of Scientology, you can do anything you want to them. Like you know, Scientologists would poison the, the dogs of of uh, people they didn't like. They would they would put posters up around their area saying the person was a paedophile. That's what fair game meant. And fair game as a principle also applied to women, mo it was mostly women at that stage, who, who stood up against the ideology. So I, I realized that it was evil and wrong and I thought, well, I'm gonna start speaking about it. And I, had, and I, I knew I was kind of, I, I had some things coming up that were fairly safe. Um, so I decided to start going for it, you know, because no one else was, and it was too important mm -hmm. not to, you know. As Posey was saying just a few seconds ago, sorry, Kelly, you know, she was saying she thinks about her, her kids, she thinks about the, the, the older woman who doesn't want a, a man uh, undressing her as a carer. You know, these are all real people, real situations, real problems that need to be discussed in a, in a rational way. You know, and they're not being discussed. They're not, they, in fact, the whole, the, even the idea of discussion was considered evil. There was no debate was a phrase. It's crazy. None of this stuff is, can be, can, you, you can't sustain it. It's untenable. It's madness. So I thought, no, I have to, I have to speak about it. And like Scientology, do you find that a lot of people didn't even know that they were meant to be offended by things? So they're almost guided by the yeah. central committee or a church yeah, yeah, yeah. to to pick a victim and be set upon them practically? Yeah, yeah. and Twitter has made that process easier. You know, you can find a victim, uh, all you need to do is get a few... It seems to me that every friendship group has one, one of these activists, and that friendship group is... These activists are often very narcissistic, uh, misogynistic, um, uh, they're um, uh, easily uh, um, offended, and, and they're just whipping up their friends into the same kind of anger and frenzy that they feel. Oh, he's saying transit. And also, <clears throat> another thing about the ideology is it's completely incoherent. The rules change every, from moment to moment. So they'll say, oh, he's saying it's a mental illness. And it's like, well, what is it? What is gender dysphoria if it's not a mental illness? You know, and then they say, oh, th th these people are, are some of the most vulnerable people in the world. They have a, they have a mental illness. <laughs> it's like, well, you just said a second ago that we're not to say it's a mental illness. So they basically make up the rules as they go along so they can maintain their position as the most vulnerable group in the world. And it just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, you know. And you're constantly being able uh, told to deny what you literally see in front of you, yeah. including quoting them back. Yeah. Like there's the We Spa incident recently. Do you know about that in California? Yeah. Yeah. So both they, they, they say it's a hoax, that it didn't happen, that it was a trans woman, but then it was a normal man. Yeah. Do you mean, but and all of those things exist at the same time in their argument? And, yeah, exactly. But if you call out that uh, the contradictions, you're a bigot, yeah. and yeah. just even having applying logic to someone's argument is seen as bigotry. E even trying to scrutinise the subject mm -hmm. to figure out what happened is considered a, an aggressive act, mm -hmm. you know? And, and the reason it's considered an aggressive act is because, again, this, the, this ideology is so incoherent that any scrutiny makes it just dissolve. If you were to get, let's say, <coughs> an hour-long panorama episode where people sit around and they talk about this subject and you had people you know like po like Kelly J or or or, uh, or, or, or Sinead Watson or, or Kira Bell or any any of these smart um, uh, uh, engaged knowledgeable people on um, who don't agree with, with gender ideology the, the, their opponents would, would crumble in front of everyone's eyes because they cannot back up their debates. They're, sorry, they cannot back up their positions. All they can do is smear, lie, call people racists, call people homophobes, do whatever, whatever they want. Um, uh, and, and everyone just kind of goes along with it, you know? But the truth is that their ideology is homophobic and their ideology is, is often racist, you know? Like one of the things you hear a lot is trans women are women just like black women are women. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck are you? You're saying that men are women just like black women are women. How, how do you not see how racist that is? And it's, it's, 
it's an endlessly um, it, it's like it's like uh, beating up a, a one of those um, blow up clowns. You remember them? The kids would punch and they fall over and then they pop back up again. And that's what it's like. It's like easy, but for some reason they just never lie down because the arguments can be easily refuted. But it doesn't matter. They just keep coming back, you know. And we've got the danger here in Scotland with new hate crime legislation that a lot of it's, well, all of it's down to perception. Yeah. And when the people who are perceiving a crime are this able to hold illogical concepts in their heads, yeah. there's a lot of danger putting power into their hands to criminalise people Absolutely. when they can't even particularly define what the problem was. Do you understand what I mean? And we yeah. can't, you, you, you can always lose in an argument with somebody who can have so many positions at once. Yeah and argue them in a confusing manner, but you're meant to give it as equal respect to a lot, yeah. actually more, more credence to it than a logical argument that exactly. the opponent has. They're told, we're told that they must be given so much respect that we can't even question them. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth is that their positions uh, do not deserve any respect because they are homophobic, uh, misogynistic, incoherent positions that change like the weather so they don't deserve any respect but the idea that they don't deserve any respect is is in itself uh considered transphobic or or, or wrong so and the other thing that it do, that the hate crime uh, law does is that it um empowers the worst people on earth and there's been a regular phenomenon at the moment uh like with lisa keogh Kyo, yeah. uh, Aberté, yeah. and basically everyone else who's been through this this issue of being reported for transphobia, mm. that the punishment in itself is the due process that's been yeah. created to uh, defend this ideology. Yeah, the whole thing. They know that they they know that they have all these institutions nervous, so they know that an accusation of transphobia will will kick off a process that will just create havoc in a person's life. You know, they'll be they'll be uh, uh, they'll be uh, abandoned by their friends. They'll be uh, um, smeared left, right, and centre without being able to fight back against it. It's it's uh, again, it's just empowering some of the worst people on earth. You know, people who 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 if they if they didn't have this extra arm of the of the government helping them, all they'd be doing is trolling people on Twitter. But suddenly the the government is 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 kind of helping some of the worst trolls on Twitter, you know? I've also found that to defend yourself from these accusations is pushing people into the public eye in a way that maybe nobody would particularly want to be. It has yeah. to make minor celebrities out of people yes, who are just living right. a normal life yeah. because they have to expose what's going on to actually not be fired or get... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like a... Um, uh, a ca it's a complete catch-22 for anyone who's, who's accused of it, you know. The, the, most of the um, complaints that I've seen levelled against people have failed. Like Johnny Best had one brought up by his university, it was thrown out. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I got uh, contacted by the police, didn't turn into anything. It's just, but the point is, that the police contact you. The, the point is that they create a little bit of havoc in your life that will hopefully cause you stress. And, uh, and, and you know, the thing about stress as well is it causes you to do things you wouldn't normally, normally do, like it causes you to lash out angrily and stuff like this. That's the point. It's a way of, it's, a, it's, like, it's like tying a, an animal down with lots of different ropes all staked into the ground and suddenly you can't move. Um, and you know, my, my, my good look and bad look in this fight is that I didn't have many ropes they could tie to me. As I say, I didn't have a, I didn't have a, a hierarchy over me, so they couldn't, they couldn't complain to my bosses about me. Um, all they could do in the end was target my family, you know, and that, you know, that, that led to where it led, which is what my wife and I had to split up after a while because the stress was so much, you know. I'm really sorry about that. So you did a stunt where you joined the dating app for lesbians and bisexual women called Her. Yes. So you made a character and joined, which is within the terms and conditions of the app. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing I was pointing out. I was, I was trying to draw attention to the fact that um, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of these men who are simply calling themselves lesbians. They're not 
changing their appearance at all. And they're going onto these sites and they're invading lesbian spaces and they're, in a very insulting way, appropriating their, their reality. So this is pure homophobia. So I did this, I did this uh, stunt where I pretended to do this. Um, I joined up with her uh, successfully. Um, and, uh, but I wasn't, I didn't go on the site, I didn't do anything except join up, you know. I didn't really want to meet people who wanted to meet me, a, a male lesbian. Um, and, and it was just reported as if a lot of people, even like Helen Lewis, who's, who, who writes for The Atlantic, described it as cruel. But she doesn't see the men who are doing it as, for real as cruel. She thinks that's fine, presumably. So it's just this strange double standard that these liberal commentators have, where these men who look exactly like me, who have made no effort to look like a woman, are calling themselves lesbians and going on this site, and they think that's absolutely fine. For me, that's the cruelty. It's cruel to do that to lesbians. But they just, as I, one thing Magdalene Byrne said to me when she was, she was alive was, she said, she said, no one cares about lesbians, you know? And I always found that really melancholy, because it's true, because lesbians are a minority within the LGBT movement. Um, they're not as well represented as gay men at all. They're certainly not well rep as well represented as trans women at the moment. And they're just ignored. And, they're, and they're, 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 they're situa their plight is ignored. So I was trying to draw attention to it. But uh, of course it was, as usual, it was, um, uh, it was uh, you know, it was described as transphobic and all sorts of, sorts of things. But I think one of the things that, that it, I think one of the things that happened is, People see me pulling, a, pulling a, a face and pretending to be a simpering woman, and they think I'm exaggerating, and I'm not. <laughs> this is what they're doing, you know? So it's, um, so it's a stunt that worked in a, in a weird way almost too well, <laughs> because in the end, I just looked like another one of these guys, you know? Do you find that generally shining a light on the issues is considered cruel? Yes. And that this is potentially, not to put words in your mouth, but is a way to cover for a lot of other abuses in society and it's a systemic trick almost to yeah. start making out that des describing abusive things well, is these, cruel to someone. All these people who are, who are uh, smearing the people like me who are trying to expose it, they are adding to a situation where, like I, I always tell this story, but you know, everyone knows about the cotton, cotton ceiling. There's thousands of examples of it. The cotton ceiling is that disgusting term given by trans women who, who see it as a problem, a cotton ceiling, cotton being panties, uh, who see it as a problem that lesbians don't want to sleep with them, right? It's a disgusting, rapey phrase, um, and it's important to draw attention to it. So anyone who smears someone who's trying to draw attention to this is, is kind of enabling these abusive men, you know? So, uh, yeah, they're, 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 if you're not, if, for me, if you're not fighting against this stuff um, as visibly as you can safely do, then you're a collaborator, you know? You're collaborating in, in something that's, um, that's evil, misogynistic and homophobic and, and abusive, you know? And, and I, I just don't understand why more people aren't, aren't kind of helping, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you also find, what, what I find from the fact that I actually do talk to people who are trans-identifying and detransitioners, many of whom are my friends, I find that people who actually do engage with the subject in real life and have experience of these topics are more likely to actually be more outspoken about protecting young people who are transitioning and even adults who are in the, the mental state where they would like to transition yes. and that a lot of the most vitriolic people online don't actually have anything to do with the subject. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's the allies who are the worst of all. So, Glinner, have you ever met any detransitioners and talked to them about their experiences? Well, yeah, I mean, like, uh, we started doing a YouTube show called The Mess We're In, which we do a, a weekly um, with Benji, uh, GNC-centric, who was kicked off Twitter by a trans-identified male. Um, and, the, and she was kicked off because, you know, she absolutely nails, again, the kind of um, uh, the, 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 the gaslighting, the homophobia, uh, the sexism of, of, of the movement. You know, she was part of a Morgan Page's LGBT group. Morgan Page is still on the Stonewall website. 
And she says there were some very inappropriate relationships going on with older trans women, in other words men, and very young uh, trans men, in other words girls. So the same, the same uh, dynamics that you always see, which is younger men or older men uh, uh, targeting younger girls. Except it had this kind of, it was wrapped in this rainbow colour by being a LGBT support group. There's no such thing. It's, it's pure grooming, pure grooming, you know. In fact, Benji told me that the trans men would be told that they had male privilege and they should, they should be supporting the trans women more. These are young girls being told that they should support men. It's outrageous, you know. So I think that, that what's happening at the moment is such a kind of advanced form of gaslighting and, uh, um, uh, you know, mind fuckery that it's going to leave a lot of people stranded in a few years with damaged bodies and, and damaged psyches and they're not going to know where to turn. You know, they've, they've, they've insulted all the people who were trying to fight for them. You know, they're going to realise those people were, those the so-called turfs were fighting for them all this time. And, and I, I just don't, I just, I think the worst thing about it is that the, the constant weaponizing of suicide, I think that might be a self-fulfilling prophecy because there are going to be a lot of people who are terribly damaged by this in the end. And I can only hope that they find something to hold on to the way Kira has and Sinead have, you know, because they're going to need it, you know.